Good evening. It's wonderful to see you all suddenly appear on the screen. It's like you all flooded into the room, like uh, in the old days when we could all gather uh, and speak to each other face to face. Um, well, we're not able to do that just yet, so I'd like to uh, welcome James Twining to this latest MTS Together event. Before we begin, uh, a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, if you have any questions for James to answer at the end, then please use the chat feature. Uh, address the question to Merchant Taylor's School, and uh, it will be picked up by Mrs. Binloss, who will put it to James uh, at the end. Uh, this talk is absolutely free, uh, but of course we're also here to support the school's push to provide hardship bursaries at this most difficult time. Many of you have already made voluntary donations and very many thanks to you if you have. Uh, if you haven't yet, but you'd like to, uh, then please use the link on the uh, website. I think you'll find it in the development office area. Uh, so let me say a few words to introduce James Twining. Uh, he's one of us, he's an OMT. Uh, and he left school a little while ago and went on to Oxford. James then uh, made his way into the city before setting up his own business. And that business won him the accolade of being one of the best of young British entrepreneurs uh, in the New Statesman magazine. Uh, he's very active in the Merchant Taylors Company and he also serves as a governor of our school. Now, James, claims that he was never interested in becoming a novelist, but he has somehow managed to find a way to write four very successful thrillers anyway. And uh, I'm uh, halfway through the first of them, and uh, I must confess I'm hooked. So without further ado, um, I want to say thank you very much for joining us, James. And uh, now over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Simon. Uh, evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, and I know you've I know you've not got much else to do in lockdown on a Wednesday night, but I appreciate it all the same. And I think it's great that um, you know we can uh, come together uh, in these difficult times, as Simon said. So, I'll talk to you tonight about um, about um, art and art theft and and and, and the novels. And um, don't worry, this isn't going to be a total sales job. Um, uh, uh, but but as it happens, the, the the various thefts that feature in my books are the ones I, I tend to know the most about. So I, I'm I'm sort of uh, they're, they're a vehicle really for me to sort of talk a little bit more about art theft. Um, I'm going to sh share a presentation. Um, so um, that will take up most of your screen rather than my face. You'll be pleased to know. Um, and I will put that up there now. So hopefully you can all uh, see that. Um, and that picture, by the way, um, in case you're interested, that's that's a picture called Tarquin and Lucretia by Rubens. Um, disappeared in 1945 at the fall of Berlin. Um, and the reason it's got folds in it is because it was tucked under the jacket of a Russian soldier who, who took it back to Moscow. The picture vanished for 50 odd years, um, surfaced again in 2003 when a consortium of shady Russian businessmen tried to sail it back to the, to the German state. Uh, they refused to, um, they wanted $50 million for it, which is probably cheap at the price. Uh, they refused to, uh, to, to deal with that, um, to deal with them and the picture has not been seen since. But um, just to tell you a little bit more about myself, um, I, I've um, spent my career actually in and around financial services. Uh, I run an insurance broker, uh, spent my, started my career in investment banking. Um, done various random things. I guess it, it's, um, it shows you that uh, I wouldn't call it a career. It's more sort of a, a, a succession of happy accidents. Um, but for many years, I've had a, I had a sideline as a, as a thriller writer, and I've published four novels set in the art world, or, or more accurately, the art underworld. Um, and my hero is, is a retired art thief called Tom Kirk. Um, and these books have been fairly successful. Um, they've not been that successful, otherwise I'd be talking to you from a, from a Caribbean island, I expect, rather than from uh, North London. But um, they've been, uh, they've sold hundreds of thousand copies, translated into over 20 languages, and here you've got some examples of, um, of, of, sort of different covers from, from, from around the world. And, and perhaps the thing I was most pleased of, I've, I've, I've actually been a specialist subject on Mastermind, um, uh, Richard Tring, his specialist subject was the Tom Kirk novels by James Twining. 
um, I have to tell you, he got 14 and I got 10. So um, he, he knows them a lot better than I did. So, but what the books are, I guess, are an expression of a lifelong interest in, in art um, and art theft. And it's an interest that started on a, on a Sunday evening when I was about 10 years old, uh, when I sat down with my father to, to, to see this guy, to watch, to watch, to watch a, a movie. And it started with Bond and I'll, I'll tr hopefully this will work. And I'll, I'm gonna show you the, the moment in question. Forgive my not shaking hands. It becomes a bit awkward with these a misfortune. You were admiring my aquarium. Yes. It's quite impressive. A unique feat of engineering, if I may say so, I designed it myself. The glass is convex, 10 inches thick, which accounts for the magnifying effect. Minnows pretending they're whales. Just like you on this island, Dr. No. It depends, Mr. Bond, on which side of the glass you are. A medium dry martini, lemon peel, shake, not stir. Vodka? Of course. We'll have dinner at once. There's so much to discuss, so little time. Right, so, um, that painting that Bond was staring at was uh, is a portrait of Wellington by Goya. It's in the National Gallery. Um, and, and it was a bit of an in-joke because a few weeks before, um, a few weeks before filming had started, that, that painting had been stolen. Um, and the background was that uh, a man called Charles Reitzman, who was a sort of American billionaire, had bought the painting uh, in 1961. And, um, and there was a huge outcry that this, this sort of national treasure was sort of leaving the country to, to go to America. And actually the government raised the necessary funds to match the sum but, and bought it for the National Gallery. But three weeks after it was, it was installed, it, it, it was stolen. And um, the thief demanded a ransom um, of um, the same amount as, as the government had paid for it and said he was gonna give the money to charity. And then a, a year or so later, he sent a ticket to, um, uh, to a claim ticket to London's Daily Mirror, and they went along to a train station. And the painting was sort of sat there in a, in a, in a, in a railway baggage office. And it turned out that the thief was um, uh, this man, um, Kempton Bumpton. He was um, an unemployed bus driver. And he gave himself up six months later, and, and he planned to use the money uh, that he had gathered to buy TV licenses for the poor, uh, because he was sort of outraged that poor people should have to pay TV licenses. Um, and, you know, I guess the latest in a long line of sort of British eccentrics, but, but actually that year, uh, this year, or sorry, last year, a film was released starring Harold Miller and Jim Broadbent, uh, Jim Broadbent playing, playing the part of Kempton Bumpton. Um, and I think, I think, therefore, what captured my imagination a, a little bit, even, even then, um, was that beyond the aesthetic and intrinsic value of a, of a painting, let's say, there's, there's often a story. Um, uh, how it came into being, who the artist was, the countries the painting's been in, who's in it, what's it about, who's owned it, uh, the countries that it's traveled through, and maybe even, of course, the thefts that it's been a victim of. If you'd like this portrait, uh, this, is, this is a portrait by Rembrandt, Jacob III of Guine. Um, this is known as the takeaway Rembrandt because it's been, it's been stolen four times in the last 40 years. Uh, it's in Dulwich Picture Gallery, it's been found on the back of a bicycle. It's been on, found under a bench in a graveyard. Um, each time returned anonymously. No one's ever been charged with its theft. Theft, but of course, you know, it's a painting which is now so well known it would be Im impossible to sell. Um, and actually, near me, um, uh, this painting by Vermeer was stolen from from Kenwood House in in the 1970s, and the frame of the painting was found um, half a mile on Hampstead, away from Kenwood House on on the heath. Um, and then a strip of canvas was sent uh, to, to, the, to, the, um, to the Times with a, with, a, with a ransom note that two IRA hunger strikers should be released to Northern Ireland to complete their sentences there. Um, and then there was a threat that the painting would be burnt on St. Patrick's night. Um, and then eventually it was actually found uh, in a London churchyard, left in a London churchyard, and the police found it. And, and although this lady here, Rose Dugdale, was never... Um, convicted of the crime, she was widely believed to have carried out this theft um, and, and actually 
uh, a few months later, she she and the accomplices stole um, uh, another Vermeer uh, from Rusborough House in County in County Wicklow. Vermeer is an interesting one for me also because because of this painting. This is a painting known as um, have, I, have I lost the picture? There we go. This is a paint, picture known as Christ the Adulterous. Um, you know, it's not in any of my stories, but it's a sort of interesting picture because at the end of the Second World War. Um, the Allies found this painting in a salt mine um, where top Nazis had hidden sort of various works of art. Um, and they brought in these military, these various artistic experts trying to work out who these paintings were by and who they belonged to. And, and um, part of the collection they found in this salt mine actually belonged to Goering. Um, and Goering's collection included this Vermeer. Uh, but the problem was none of the experts knew this painting. Um, and they tracked down through the record that it had been sold uh, to uh, Goering by a Dutch dealer, a Dutch, well, a Dutch citizen who was actually running a nightclub by then called Hans van Meegeren. And um, when he couldn't explain where this painting had come from, he was actually arrested um, as a collaborator um, and, and uh, charged with treason. Um, and he said, look, he said, look, no, 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 look, I've got to come clean here. It's a forgery. I painted it. Um, um, it's not a real Vermeer. They didn't believe him because it was such a good, uh, it was such a good uh, painting. Um, and they challenged him. They locked him in a, in a in a sort of room or series of rooms, I don't know, um, and um, challenged him to paint another Vermeer to prove that he could he could do that. Um, and he painted. A, he he did that. He painted a, a new picture uh, called the Young Christ Teaching in the Temple under the eyes of of the police. Um, and they changed the charge from treason to forgery. Um, and he went on trial um, and uh, this became a huge story in, in Holland at the time. And, and this guy became a bit of a folk hero. In fact, in the week before the trial, there was a poll which showed that he was the second most popular, ma popular man in the Netherlands after the prime minister, which I'm not sure is a particularly high bar to jump, but, but there you go. Um, so, you know, interesting stories in and around the, these paintings um, and, and um, my, if, if I just very briefly, my second book um, is really the story of, of the, the Hungarian gold train. Um, um, it's called the Black, the book's called The Black Sun, but this was a special train commandeered by Eichmann in the dying days of the war to carry the sort of wealth of, of, um, of Hungary uh, to safety. Uh, and it was full of gold and typewriters and lingerie and paintings and porcelain and sort of everything they could have. Um, they could get their hands on you know there was there was um i think there were four crates of uh, of wedding rings uh, uh, you know as as an example um the train was abandoned in a tunnel um and um uh, the the value the value of of the of the goods on it was about 206 million dollars then which is two or three billion dollars today so it was hugely valuable um unfortunately there's a, there's a very sad story around this, which is when the Americans seized the train, they decided that it was enemy property and basically seized it for themselves. And there's been huge court cases ever since around the ownership of this train and, and, and what was on it. Um, some of the uh, American generals sort of hand, you know, basically helped themselves to what was in it. Um, and it was only actually in 1999, so not that long ago, that the US authorities finally admitted what they'd done and, and paid compensation to the, to the heirs of the Hungarian Nazi victims. And the premise of my book is very simply, well, what if there was another carriage what, and, uh, you know, that, that had been hidden in this tunnel and, and that was not recovered? And if so, what might have been on it? My, 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 my fourth book is, is about the, the, the trade in antiquities. Um, and it, it starts with the reappear, potential reappearance of this painting. It's the Nativity by Caravaggio and stolen from a church in Sicily in, in 1969 uh, by person or persons unknown but thought to be linked to the local mafia. Um, but this story really is built around a, a raid that was done on, on the, um, in, the, in Geneva on, a, on one of the free ports there um, where they found a, a treasure trove of stolen antiquities um, and, and evidence that these antiquities had been traded with some of the world's greatest museums, including the Met and the Getty um, and, and others. Um, they found around 10,000 individual artifacts in this warehouse worth about $35 million. Um, and um, 
and you know that they, they they had this sort of incredible photo record really of what had happened so the the um this picture here is 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 of an object um uh, recovered uh, from a tomb sort of roughly laid on the floor and then this is the same object i don't know whether you can see that um this is the same object in the um in a museum cleaned up sold put on display you know the sort of white 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 clean um and um, off the back of this, um, off the back of this raid, a huge number of sort of people went, went to prison. Um, Marion True, who was the uh, curator of antiquities at, at the Getty, uh, was was um, arrested and charged with conspiracy to smuggle and uh, you know, illegal antiquities trading. Um, and um, you know, her, her defense was that everyone was doing it. <laughs> she just carried, ended up carrying the can for it. So it's interesting, but since since the raid on this um, on this warehouse, the the uh, police estimate that the illegal digging in Italy is reduced by a half. So the, this was a massive um, uh, yeah, massive uh, enterprise. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to focus on 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 the sort of underlying thefts behind in two of my books. Um, the the first one uh, concerns this painting, which you you, you may recognise. Um, now it's interesting because there are very few genuine da Vinci paintings today, perhaps 15, I mean, and even that is somewhat debated. Um, and there, 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 it's not even entirely clear how many versions of, of the Mona Lisa were in fact painted, because if you go to the Dulwich Picture Gallery, there's, there's a version there which has actually got columns on either side. Um, so this was by um, uh, you know, by Da Vinci's own um, admission, his his sort of favourite painting. He carried it with him everywhere, um, and he sold it to the King of France on his deathbed. Um, uh, and it was the only painting, uh, I believe, that he sort of kept with him for his whole life. Um, and and Francois the First installed this painting in Fontainebleau, um, and then it was moved by Louis the Fourteenth to Vers to Versailles. Um, and interesting, Louis XV hated it and, and uh, ordered it removed from the palace and it ended, it ended up in, in the hands of a palace bureaucrat and a warehouse. Um, and then actually it was in the Louvre, moved to the Louvre when the Louvre opened. And it's been in the Louvre pretty much ever since, apart from when Napoleon was in power, he liked it so much he actually hung it in his bedroom, which I guess is what you can do when you're the, you're the Emperor of France. Um, and since then, since the podium, the picture's only been moved five times, twice when it was stored for safekeeping in the Franco-Prussian War and the Second World War, um, twice when it went on tour to the US um, in the 70s and then, and then to, uh, sorry, in the 60s and to Moscow and Tokyo in the 70s, and once when it was stolen in 1911. Um, now, you know, nobody would have thought that you could have stolen the Mona Lisa, but, but it is what happened. And actually the theft, the theft was discovered by um, a Parisian artist called Louis Beru, who um, made his money by copying famous paintings for the tourist market. Um, and he turned up to do a sort of copy of the Mona Lisa. And what he found was this picture, which is, if you can just make out the four pegs on the wall where the picture should have been. Um, and he thought, he asked the guard, was the painting the guard? So it's probably being downstairs, being photographed. Um, he, he said, well, look, can you go and have a, have a look for me? And the guard returned a few minutes later looking a bit pale. Um, and the museum had been shut the previous day and no one had seen the painting since, since the Sunday. So this was, this was uh, I think, a, a, yeah, a, a, a Monday, Monday or Tuesday, I forget now. Um, the museum was sealed. They searched it room by room. Um, um, you, you know, it took them a week to search the entire premises because the Louvre is 49 acres big. It's probably bigger now since the expansion. Um, Borders were sealed, every ship and train was searched, every, every person in the Cumbria was, was examined. Um, the frame was found on an empty staircase um, just, just outside. And, and actually, you know, amazingly, they found a thumbprint on it, a left thumbprint. The only problem was back in those days, they only collected right hand thumbprints, fingerprints. So that was no use to them either. Um, and actually when the Louvre reopened a few weeks later, thousands of people sort of filed past just to see the empty spot on the wall. Um, and um, people, people got angry, um, um, people blamed um, the, 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 yeah, um, uh, some secretive American millionaire of having commissioned the theft. 
lots of people blame the Germans. Why not? Um, uh, uh, given, you know, it was a few years before the outbreak of the war. Uh, people thought that the Louvre administrator had stolen it deliberately in order to boost the attendance numbers. Um, Guillaume Apollinaire, the French poet, was was um, was arrested because he'd once called for the Louvre to be burnt down. And even even um, Picasso actually was um, was was questioned for it, uh, mainly because he was he was fingered by Apollinaire, which uh, is um, interesting. But um, you know, it turned into a sort of a huge scandal. Everyone blaming everyone else. No one knew where it was. Big rewards offered. Um, they even they even uh, turned to clairvoyance to try and find out where this painting was. Um, but but you know, there were progress was being made by this man, Louis Lapine, who was a police inspector. And he what he worked out was a thief must have posed as a tourist on the Sunday, hidden overnight in a storeroom knowing that the next day was a Monday when it was shut. So that's right, it was shut on a Monday, open on Tuesday. So he had, he had a sort of a clear run to get, to get away. And after waiting for the guard to get out, he'd simply gone in, lifted it off the wall, um, taken it to the staircase, got it out the frame, put it under his tunic and, and, and sort of walked, walked, literally walked out the building dressed as a sort of plumber or an electrician or something. Um, and what he didn't know was that theft was actually the, the brainchild of an Argentinian con man uh, called Eduardo de Valfierno, and he, he claimed to be a Marquis. He, he famously once sold the Eiffel Tower as scrap metal to a, to a gullible French businessman. Um, and he teamed up with, a, with a, an art restorer and forger called Yves Chaudron and commissioned six paintings, six Mona Lisas. Um, and then he hired a former Louvre employee and petty criminal called Vincenzo Perugia uh, to carry out the theft. Um, and, and of course, why did he need the theft? He didn't actually want the original. What he wanted was the original stolen so he could sell the six copies that he made as originals. Um, and um, as, soon as, as soon as the theft was announced, he sold the copies and he was never heard of again. And the thief never heard from him again. So the thief was stuck holding this painting, which the entire country was looking at. He hid it actually, um, there's a more picture. He actually hid it under his stove. That's a picture, bottom left, that's a picture of his bedroom and his stove. The picture was, the painting was hidden under the stove. Um, and um, for, two, for, you know, for two years, nothing happened. And then actually the, the thief Perugia, he, he went to Italy. Um, he went to Florence to see an art dealer there. And um, he, he, he basically offered to sell him the Mona Lisa um, for 500,000 lira and a guarantee that the painting would not go back to France. Um, and uh, the, 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 the man he'd been to see, this antiques dealer, called his buddy, who was the um, director of the Uffizi, um, and they went back to the room and they, he had a sort of chest and the chest had a false bottom and he lifted up the false bottom and, and there, there was the Mona Lisa. And uh, you know the, the seals were on the back. Um, and what they said to him was, well, look, um, we need to examine it back at the Uffizi, check it's the real thing. Um, and um, I don't think he was the sharpest tool in the box anyway, but he sort of said, okay. I'll wait for you here. And of course, you know, they took the painting and, and the next knock on the door was from the police. Um, he was, uh, Perugia was brought to trial. Um, he went, spent a year in, year in prison. Um, uh, he claimed to have made, done the theft for, for reasons of Italian pride. I don't think that's an oxymoron, but it could be. Um, and um, and uh, he died in 1947. The painting went back to France. It had a sort of triumphal march uh, through through France. Um, people sort of lining the streets to sort of see it go past. Um, and neither Valfiano or Chaudron would were ever caught. Um, and um, you know, that, I guess a key a key part of the premise of, of of my book is what if the real Mona Lisa was never actually put back. You know, that's the, that was the sort of the germ of the idea. Um, I think I think I, I, another um, uh, I'll just move to this page here. Yes, an, an, another sort of interesting um, quirk of the art world, which I sort of think I find interesting, is in 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 two thousand uh, Christie's and Sotheby's released a catalogue for an impressionist sale, and they were a little bit surprised when they both when they realised they were both selling the same painting. Um, it was it was this one. It's called Vase de Fleurs Lila by Gauguin, um, and it's a mid market Gauguin um, um, worth a couple of well worth at the time several hundred thousand dollars, probably worth a bit more now. Um, and the auction houses 
flew both works to um, to a Gauguin expert at the Wildenstein Institute in Paris, um, and she sat them side by side, and she said, "Well, actually, the Christie's one is the right one." Um, sorry, the Christie's one was not quite right, but she said it was the best Gauguin counterfeit she'd ever seen. In fact, it was so good that it must have been painted side by side with the original. There was no way that it could have been that good. Um, and and Christie's went back to the to, to the owners of the painting. They were a little bit. Uh, shocked. It was the sort of Gary Muse in, in Tokyo um, and the FBI was called in and they traced the sale back to a dealer called Eli Sakai, which is this guy uh, here on the screen. Um, um, and, and they found that he'd sort of effectively both sold the painting to um, this gallery in Tokyo and then actually sold a painting also in his own name through another auction house. And, and what it was, was a very audacious scam, because what he was doing was buying pictures of roughly the same, you know, buying mid-market pictures, which didn't attract, which had a good brand name, but didn't attract too much attention. Um, buying another painting of far lesser quality, but of a similar period, cleaning the canvas off, getting a forgery painted on the canvas, because the hardest thing to fake is canvas age. Um, and then selling the forgery with the original papers of authenticity uh, in case anyone queried it, they had the papers and then selling the original without them, but it's the original, so it would always stand up to scrutiny. Um, and he'd done this time and time again with, um, with, with various different paintings. Um, and it was one of these sort of, I mean, I, one of these sort of scams, which, which could never happen today because of the electri, you know, the catalogs being online and people being able to sort of compare things there, but he sort of exploited, if you like, um, uh, people's greed, um, the, the sort of thirst for the Japanese uh, galleries at that time for anything sort of impressionist and not asking too many questions, and also just the sort of way that the art market looks after its own, and probably quite a few people knew what he was up to, but they didn't, um, they didn't um, sort of speak up about it. So he, he, he spent time in prison, was fined twelve and a half million dollars uh, uh, for federal um, mail fraud. Uh, which is sort of an, an interesting way to get someone. So um, f f the final thing I'm, I'm going to talk about um, in, terms of, in terms of the books is, is my, my, I guess, my, my, my first book, the one that Simon held up before, it's called The Double Eagle. You know, what is a double eagle? A double eagle is a $20 coin. A $10 coin is called an eagle. Um, they came into being after the 1848 gold rush. Um, uh, you know, the, the country was awash uh, with gold. Uh, created this this design of coin, um, and um, they they contained a full ounce of gold, and they were really meant to be sort of symbolic, I guess, of of this new country's um, ambition and and wealth and power and, and success. And these coins bearing this design were issued between eight, 1850 and, and 1907. Um, but in 1907, the design changed, and and after President McKinley was assassinated. Teddy Roosevelt um, uh, became at you know at 43, I guess at the time the youngest president in the nation's history, um, and he was he, he was he had many interests. He was into lots of things, but one of the things he was interested in was producing uh, um, coinage which really sort of uh, captured um, the, the 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 sort of the, the spirit and soul of America. And, and in particular, coinage which evoked the power and the, and the majesty of, of ancient Greece, the birthplace of democracy. And, and he focused on the $20 coin, the, the, the double eagle. And he commissioned his friend, uh, a sculptor called Augustus Sanguardin. Um, he, he was actually born in Ireland, but moved to New York when he was very young. Um, and he commissioned him to, to come up with a new coin. And Sanguina is, is today best known as, as a sculptor of Civil War monuments. You might recognize this one. It's at the uh, southern tip of Central Park, um, just, just near the Plaza Hotel. Um, um, and, and he asked him to come up with a design. And he, and he came up with a design of um, really, I think, real beauty and elegance. Um, it, it, on one side, it's got the, the figure of, of liberty advancing with a sort of torch of enlightenment in one hand and the olive branch of peace in the other. Um, it's got the dome of the Capitol building um, uh, in, in the background, symbolizing sort of democracy and the 48 stars around the rim for the 48 states at the time. Um, 
and then the value of the coin and the sort of majestic sort of flying uh, eagle. Um, but the problem, the problem with this was that um, the, the, the coin was a very high relief. You might be able to see, and, and that created lots of issues in terms of the actual manufacture because it had to be hit. It had to be struck many times in order to create one, toy, one coin. Um, and it didn't stack, which is not super useful. So um, the, mint, the mint engraver complained and, and much to Roosevelt's dismay, a sort of slightly um, modified design was adopted. Still essentially the same, but much lower relief. Um, and then the other interesting thing is the Roman numerals have been placed, replaced with Arabic ones. Um, and um, the, the motto in God we trust um, has, been, has been added. Um, and actually Roosevelt thought it was sacrilegious to have God's name on, on, on money. Um, uh, but uh, Congress had required since 1866 that um, every American coin or note uh, should have that motto on it, and, and he was overruled. Um, and these coins were therefore minted uh, until 1933, um, but in 1933 everything changed. Well, what changed Black Thursday, the Wall Street clash and, and the crash, and, uh, you know, as we know, the sort of optimism, if you like, of the, of the sort of roaring 20s sort of gave way to industrial paralysis, dust bowls, widespread unemployment, bread lines. Um, and, and um, you know, by 1933, so that was in 29, I should say, by 1933, the situation got even worse. Uh, 40 million Americans, a quarter of the workforce unemployed, Wall Street on its knees. Um, and, um, uh, and, and this man came into power, FDR, uh, Teddy's cousin, um, inaugurated um, as the 32nd president. And at the time, the US banking system was, um, was on the edge of ruin. And like the reason for that was like everyone else, um, the banking system was effectively uh, set up on the gold standard. Uh, every dollar of currency backed up a physical amount of gold stored around the country. Um, but with stocks and bonds and everything worthless, people were hoarding gold in huge numbers um, and people were withdrawing the gold. And the problem with that, of course, is that the US couldn't print the notes in order to reflate the economy because uh, they didn't actually have the sort of hard currency uh, behind it. Um, and so one of the first things that FDR did was he banned the private ownership of gold. He passed a, a, an executive order, a presidential proclamation part of his famous 100 days, um, and, it, and it forbade the payment hoarding uh, or export of gold, um, and, then, and then followed up by another executive order which required everyone to, to, to basically um, surrender any gold they had to the federal government. Um, and failure to comply was punishable by fine or imprisonment. There were exemptions for sort of, I guess, items of historic value, but, but, but essentially, and amazingly, this order was only actually repealed by Congress in 1974. Um, but, but, you know, despite FDR having done this, the, the wheels of government carried on turning and um, rather than down tools, the Philadelphia Mint uh, carried on minting in 1933 um, these coins and it minted 445,500 of them. Um, but of course, none of them were ever, were ever issued. They couldn't be issued. They, they were, you couldn't issue, no one was allowed to own, the, the own gold. Um, so they were transferred to a holding pen 500 coins were taken out for assaying purposes to check the quality of the coins and, 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 um, and, and the gold content. Um, and then actually in 1934, all the coins, all the remaining coins, the ones that hadn't been destroyed in the assay process um, and all the ones in storage were, melt, were melted down. Um, and and uh, that, as far as most people know, was the end of the story. Except of course it wasn't because in 1944, um, a diplomatic officer of the Royal Legation of Egypt applied for an export license for a 1933 double eagle. Um, and um, he, he, he was granted that uh, license and he was acting on behalf of King Farouk of Egypt, who was a sort of voracious collector of different things. He'd built up an 8,000 uh, coin collection, uh, which many think is the greatest private collection ever assembled. Um, and the Treasury didn't recognize this coin had never been issued, so they granted them the export license. And roughly at the same time, a journalist no noticed that there was, a, there was a sale of an auction of, of um, Colonel Flanagan's coin collection. And one of the coins for sale was a 1933 double eagle. So he called up um, the Mint asking how many 1933 double eagles had been released. And they, of course, said none. Um, 
and um, and the Secret Service uh, was 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 called in. I mean, interestingly, the Secret Service, as well as having responsibility for protecting the president, also have responsibility for protecting the nation's coinage. Um, not sure why, but they do. And they were called in, and they um, they uncovered a cadre of people known as the Four Horsemen who controlled the Philadelphia Mint in the 30s. And what they were realized was that one of them in particular, a man called George McCann, had, had exclusive access to the double eagles. Um, his bank balance had been suspiciously highly inflated. Um, and he'd already been arrested previously for stealing silver coins from the Mint. So quite why they kept him on, no idea. Um, but um, they worked out that basically he had stolen coins uh, before they'd been melted down and over the uh, and, and they thought he'd stolen 10 coins um, well so they, they didn't know how many he'd stolen I think he didn't really admit to any of it but over the next few years they recovered eight of them um, and um, uh, eight on yes eight nine sorry nine coins until the only one that they hadn't got hold of was this one that was in the collection of King Farouk um, and um, after the Egyptian revolution in 1952 NASA decided to auction off all these royal assets, including the coin collection. The Americans said, well, can we have our coin back, please? Um, the, 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 they, they sort of said no. And, and the Americans at the time didn't want to press the point because it was, um, uh, you know, time of uh, Suez and, and sort of sensitive political relations, etc. cetera. Um, and the, the coin just sort of uh, vanished. Um, and then in 1995, um, uh, a man walked into an English coin dealer in St. James's called Stephen Fenton um, and uh, offering a 1933 double eagle. He, he was the daughter of a general in NASA's army who apparently had at the end of the auction when all the unsold lots, he'd offered to buy all the unsold lots and they included this, this coin. Um, and he set about selling the coin and, and news got back to um, uh, a dealer, coin dealer in America, who was also a, a, an informant for the US government. Um, and he contacted the FBI, they put him towards the treasury. Um, and, you know, 60 years, 70 years on, they still wanted their coin back. So they actually worked with him to lure Fenton to the Waldorf Astoria uh, in New York. Um, um, met him there, brought the coin out and sort of people burst into the room, arrested him, seized the coin. Um, and he fought the charges. He said, you know, his argument was, um, you know, you allowed this, you know, it's not my fault it was stolen. You allowed the company, the, co the coin to leave the country. You never pursued it aggressively with the Egyptians. You know, it's 60 years have gone by, it, it should be mine. A Solomonic ar uh, arrangement was, 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 was reached in the end, the value of the coin was split. So they auctioned it and they agreed they'd get it sort of 50-50 to the US government, 50% to, to Fenton. It was sold in 2002. Um, uh, and um, I, think, uh, I think it took um, nine minutes and it sold for about for $7.6 million. Uh, that's not including the 15% uh, buyer's premium. So it, it became and is still today the most expensive coin ever sold at auction. Um, interestingly, as well as handing over seven point whatever million dollars, you also had to hand over twenty dollars because it is still legal tender now. It is so you can walk into a Seven Eleven, buy buy a Coke, hand over the tw the, the, the twenty dollar uh, the double eagle, and you get change for a twenty. I wouldn't advise doing it. Um, and and the the, pre the premise of the book um, was, you know, sort of crazy idea really. Well, what if more coins had survived? What if it wasn't just those coins? But you know, amazingly, five or six years after I published my book, that's exactly what happened. They found 10 more of these coins. And it turned out that, that one of the other sort of of these four horsemen uh, had had 10 of these coins. I actually, I think he was a man called Israel Switz. He was a, he was a jeweler in Philadelphia. And um, he, 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 when he died, his daughter went through his possessions um, and found these coins at sort of back of a drawer um, she 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 took them to the mint so she, to sort of determine their authenticity, a bit like poor old Vincenzo Perugia with the Mona Lisa, and uh, they 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 said thank you very much. We'll have those. They belong to us. Um, huge court case um, ensued. Um, 
the the court ordered the mint to return the coins to the family um uh and um sorry the court initially found said that the government was right and then and then that that judgment was um uh, overturned uh when the court said they should go to the family um and then you know that was then further um sorry uh, that was then further appealed and they are now they are now with the government um and um uh the court they, they tried to take it to the u.s supreme court and the the supreme court refused to hear the case so that's sort of the end of the story the coins are um, in the possession of the um of the american government now of course i guess i'm sort of nearing the end now you'll be pleased to know um uh, I guess a lot of what I've discussed is sort of ancient history, right? But but I just did want to make the point that a lot of this is happening today. And actually, these are sort of headlines that I've gathered in the last month or so, uh, November, I think, onwards. Um, you know, it's, it's just worth remembering that um, according to the US Department of Justice and UNESCO, um, art crime is the third highest grossing area of criminal activity of the last 40 years um, behind drugs and arms dealing. Um, and the amount of, of income generated by art crime is estimated to be six to eight um, billion dollars a year. So this is this is big business, and it's not happening in the past. It's absolutely sort of happening uh, today. And in fact, I was sort of interested. You you may have read um, about uh, a theft. Sorry, we can't. Have you may have read about a theft. Um, uh, um, I think last year. Um, in Dresden, former Royal Treasury, um, where things, the, this sort of ceremonial sword set with 800 diamonds was stolen and um, and this uh, 49 carat uh, diamond uh, brooch um, and um, nothing, nothing's been recovered. Um, and, you know, they, 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 they had 1600 police officers on a raid across 18 separate addresses uh, to try and find the thieves. And actually what I, what I like about this if you if you want to know what what um, uh, stealing several uh, million dollars worth looks like, you they actually were caught on on camera breaking into the display cases, um, and you can see there's no subtlety about this. It's it's uh, it, I mean it's not a great picture, I admit, uh, but it gives you some sense of of the sort of brutality here. They're, they're just smashing their way uh, through these glass um, uh, windows. Um, and they were in and out in minutes, um, uh, so it's you know it's, it's quite 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 something. I mean, it sort of raises the question, I guess, you know, why do why do people steal these things? I mean, you know, or maybe that's obvious, you know, but or, or rather, who maybe even who steals them? What, what 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 what's the motivation? Clearly, there's a financial one, but actually, you know, there's 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 one theory which is actually the Doctor No theory. You know, people in hollowed out volcanoes. Um, lining their uh, sort of layers with with stolen art. A lot of people dismiss that, but actually, when 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 North London uh, crime godfather Terry Adams was arrested in two thousand and three, they found in his house. They described his house as an Aladdin's cave of stolen art and and furniture, um, stolen from country houses, galleries, and museums over the last 10, 15 years. Um, so you know, th there's you know that, that that theory i think there is some credence to to i don't know about people commissioning thefts but certainly there is a credence to sort of people um yeah um being more than willing to take these stolen goods into their houses there's also there's also the ransom theory and and in um in 1994 two turners on exhibition um in frankfurt were were stolen um they were worth around 50 million dollars and actually interestingly the tate um, who had loaned the paintings um, bought the rights to the paintings back they spent rather than they said to the they said to the um uh the, 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 the insurers paid them the 50 million pounds and then they paid the insurers eight million pounds back in order to maintain the rights to the paintings should the paintings ever be found um and they actually did find the paintings they ended up paying over three million uh, pounds to some um, sort of slightly mysterious um, shady lawyer um, and um, you know that, that so so these paintings can be sort of ransomed back and actually in the case of that uh, Tate did quite well out of it because they got both their paintings back and they got you know 
50 million pounds minus whatever they'd have to pay out to secure it. Um, the paintings are sometimes used as collateral in drugs deals. I mean, famously, the, the, the screen, which was stolen from the Munch Museum in 2004, was used as collateral in a drugs deal, a sort of make way, if you like, to sort of uh, put it up. And the other, frankly, is just the opportunist thrust, theft. I think a lot of theft is just people not necessarily having a bit of a plan, but just seizing it because they can. Um, and, um, and, and, and of course, I think those are the worst thefts of all because they don't, they probably steal it, then they realize that they've got a bit of a problem on their hands, what they're going to do with it. And, and the great fear there, of course, is they end up uh, uh, destroying it. Um, all of this um, exists, of course, uh, very uh, potently in the imagination. It's a, it's a sort of favorite form of uh, Hollywood entertainment. Um, I, uh, you know, a particular favorite of mine, I guess, just sort of slightly uh, sobering point is, you know, this is, um, it, it's all great fun. And actually I've, um, I've guilty of massive sensationalization of, of all of it. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't want anyone to think this is, uh, this is all a sort of bed of roses. It's a pretty murky, dangerous, um, violent um, world. Um, and, and, you know, I guess you know, the, what I've often said is that partly is what attracts me to this, because I think it's sort of interesting that that objects that that um, represent, in a way, everything that is best about human ingenuity, creativity, endeavor, talent, also bring out the worst in human behavior. Um, and maybe, maybe in a way, therefore, this is all part of the, the this sort of endless fight between uh, good and evil. And I guess that's the oldest story of them all. So thank you very much for listening. Very happy to take uh, some questions now. And if anyone's interested in in finding out more about the books or, or the stories behind them. I've got a website um, uh, which has got all the, re I mean, effectively, I've put all the research that I did in the books on the website. Um, and um, uh, yeah, there's lots of pictures, lots of uh, things, there's got, uh, things there for reading groups. Um, and um, uh, you might find something that you're interested in. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Um, it's I, As you were discussing that, I was sort of thinking maybe it's because it appears to be a victimless crime and so glamorous that um, it's, it's just so fascinating. And one of my questions was whether you think that all of the um, sort of electronic tracking of art and um, all of the traceability, has that reduced art theft, but I think you answered that question by saying how many pieces of art have been stolen recently. Yeah, I think I think it's it's definitely harder now because there are international databases. There's something called the Art Loss Register. And you know, if if if, um, uh, if something is stolen, it sort of goes on the register. And theoretically, if you're a reputable um, uh, auction house or dealer, before you buy anything, you would go on the art loss register and check that it wasn't on there. Um, yeah. So that, I think, I think, you know, but the, that has helped, but the world is a big place and there's lots of disreputable people around. <laughs> and so um, I think it's, it's made it harder, but, but, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, so there have been actually a number of questions, and so I've been trying to sort of gather them into themes, and there's a sort of theme about how you write, um, and then there's a theme more generally about art theft. So I thought maybe we'd talk about um, your sort of writing process, and if we could start, please, if I just get the chat up, I think that was Imogen Roberts, would you like to ask your question? And unmute Sorry, yes, I just unmuted myself. Yeah, thanks, James. That was absolutely really brilliant. I uh, um, hadn't really thought about art theft as, uh, uh, as a subject for thrillers and things. I don't know why before. And my friend uh, actually is writing a thriller at the moment. So that's quite interesting to... Uh, <laughs> so I'd be quite interested to hear about how you write because you obviously sound as though you're very, very busy in your other life i'm presuming you don't do you know how do you actually set about doing it you just mentioned you know huge amounts of research obviously before you start yeah. but actually the can you can you tell us a bit about that uh yes i mean i i have to say it's become harder over the last 10 years um and that's partly because i'm i've you know 
the jobs have become a little bit more serious and the stakes slightly higher. Um, and I've got three kids now, which I didn't have when I started. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, um, I, I think I get, I guess what I'd, so a couple of things. I, I remember when I wrote the first book, I spent three weeks and I'd written two paragraphs. Um, and I, I, I sort of had a little bit of an epiphany when I said, look, the important thing is not to try and write the perfect book first time. It's just to get something down on paper. Um, and and so I, I having having written two paragraphs in two weeks, I think I then wrote the whole of the book, a first draft of the whole book in six weeks. I just went straight through. Um, and and I found that to be quite good because it's just when you've got something to work with, then you can move stuff around, change it and, and iterate it. So that that partly is I think I think it's that sort of um, uh, just being um, having the courage, if you like, just to write just 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 write and it doesn't matter how bad you think it is it's amazing how often you'll go back and say actually that's rubbish that's rubbish. but actually that's quite good that bit of dialogue's all good that image is quite good that thing's quite good or there's a structure here that i can work with so that, that i mean that's a personal choice stephen king apparently writes final draft off the bat you know with no need for any revision at all um so people are different i think the other thing was i remember i, I read um I can't remember when I read it, but I read an interview with Ian, Fle uh, with Ian Fleming and he had a routine which I really liked um, and I sort of adopted, which was that I aimed for a certain word count a day, which I think was 2000 words. Um, and I would spend the morning editing what I'd done the day before and then the rest of the time writing the new bit. And when I got to 2000 words, I'd just stop um and he had lots of quirky being ian fleming he had you know he had to have you know a, a sort of double espresso you know at a certain degree centigrade at precisely 8 32 a.m and then he had to go have a glass of three freshly squeezed orange juices at sort of 9 22 so he had a whole uh discipline and routine oh, i wasn't quite that bad but i think that that principle of Re editing the previous day then the new editing new I found quite helpful because it meant that you were sort of going backwards and forwards but you were sort of always edging forwards but it made it a little less daunting than when you came when you sort of got to the end you didn't have to start right at the beginning and start from total scratch um uh so yeah sorry that's probably uh all I should say on that um Thank you. And also, I think, uh, Jeremy Meadow, you, you had a question that was similar to that, um, but I want to allow you to ask, ask your question. Thank you. Hello, James. Uh, that was a lovely talk. Thank you. Really good. Um, my question was, uh, on a scale of one to 10, where one is easy and 10 is really difficult, how hard do you find the plotting of your books? Uh... I think I think it has varied by book is is the answer. Um, I think um, uh, I've had I've had one which was very very painful, um, but weirdly probably it ended up being in my view the best plot. Um, but it was a very difficult. I could not see how to bring the elements together. Um, I've had one where you know the book almost wrote itself, as they say. It was just so obvious the, what what was going to happen in, in each time. I think the way the way I've thought about it, and again, this may be a particular thriller type thing, um, uh, is is um, I try and think about the um, I guess the peaks and troughs of the story, because typically with thrillers you're sort of you there's a build up and then a build down, a build up, build down. So I try and think about those sort of pivotal scenes, and then work out how I get to that scene, and then how I get from that scene to the next one. So in a in a way it's 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 a bit um, I'm trying to think of the analogy really but it's it's you know a bit like drawing a, a you know a curved line on a page it can be quite difficult to draw it freehand but if you draw the sort of intervening dots on the path you can sort of you've got a better chance of sort of making it slightly easier for yourself so I you know the problem is I always the problem with these types of questions is it's such a personal thing isn't it uh, in terms of what works and what doesn't work. Um, uh, but but as I say, it can it can be it can be easy. I think I think the you know for my mind, and this is a sort of slightly different quote comment, which is I don't think the difficult thing here is the plot. Um, the, you know, the, the, there's no shortage of good ideas. 
the, the real the real thing here is 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 um is um sticking at it it's, it's, it's a bit like edison said that you know what is it the genius is 10 percent inspiration and 90 percent perspiration i think with writing it's exactly the same you know it's just the discipline of sticking at it uh because it is you know it's you know, you sit there with a blank sheet of paper and the cursor flashing at you it's quite daunting and then you sit there with in my case hundred thousand words and you've got to sort of edit that and go back through it again and again and again and probably by the time i'd published the book, I probably would have read that 60 or 70 times. Um, you know, so I think I think I think the plotting is 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 can be can be easy, can be quite hard, but the hardest thing in a way is the application and 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 and, and the determination to see it through. Thank you. Um, and Rishi, you Rishi Chopra, you had a question. Would you like to ask it? That's also about writing style. Hi, yeah, thanks. Uh, James Fantastic talk. Um, appreciate your time tonight. Um, I, I think you have kind of touched upon my question, which is around writing again and what your advice and, and tips would be to aspiring writers. Um, uh, unless you have anything new to add to that question, um, maybe I could just flip it and ask you whether uh, your, your style as a writer developed just by doing it um, organically or whether you actually learnt your craft through, I don't know, courses or or, or, or any other kind of uh, process? Yeah, I, th I think more, definitely more organic than, um, than, than anything. And I do think, I do think my books got better as I went through. Um, my sales may not quite reflect that, but <laughs> uh, from a pure writing perspective, I, I do think my la the, the last book is by far better. I, I'm much more in I guess mastery of what I'm doing and know what I'm doing, and so I think you know practice does make perfect. And, and and as Simon said, until I wrote the first book, I'd never written a single thing in my life. Um, so it was a fairly, um, yeah, in at the deep end. I did read one thing, one book, and I think it's called How to Write a Damn Fine Novel, um, and. Um, I found that because I, I literally didn't know where to start and it was quite useful because it had things like, you know, who are your key characters, right? Write, write a biography of each one, you know, where were they at school? What are they like doing? What's their, what, what are their likes and dislikes? What's their favorite movie? What's their thing? So little things like that, um, structural points. I can't, I can't now even remember, but I thought, I mean, I thought if you're going to start somewhere, I thought that was actually quite a good, um, uh, quite a good book. It sort of helped me just in terms of getting going because I had no, I had no anchor points at all. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, uh, Victor Bentata, I think your question sort of leads us on into the um, sort of art history and art theft. Would you like to go, Victor? Oh, there we go. Hi, hi James. Uh, nice Victor. to see you. How are you? Um, yeah, it's just going to ask you about the um, relationship between your own art uh, or your own collection of various items and, and your interest in art history and whether there's any read across from art history to your day job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe of us, I don't know. Yeah, no, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I have, I, I'd love to tell you I've got sort of a couple of Rembrandts sort of in the downstairs loo, but, but, but I don't. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm, 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 um, my day job is insurance, so so you could argue that there is a bit of a crossover there. Um, and um, you know, the, the plot of the Thomas Crown affair, for instance, is really around the efforts of, a, of an insurance um, uh, art, you know, loss uh, adjuster trying to recover the stolen painting rather than have to pay out to the to the, to the museum. So, but I, I you know, not really uh, is is the answer, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and in terms of my own thing, it's it's just a, so it's an interest and a, and a passion. I, I do, um, uh, but I can't. Have, the problem is, it's a bit like my taste in cars. I can't afford the stuff I like, so I I I, I, I have to sort of um, make do with uh, pale pale uh, imitations. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so then I thought I would go on to. Um, it's quite amusing. We've got two questions that are the same, but we'll ask that later. Um, Jane Redmond, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, uh, James, that was fantastic. And I'm now um, sorted for the recommendation for my next book club 
book. So oh, it will be okay. read by at least another eight people Perfect. in the next few months. Um, um, my question is, um, what is the most significant um, painting that um, disappeared during World War II when they, everything was looted and has not yet been recovered? Well, yeah. Um, well, I mean, either that Rubens, which I showed right at the start, um, or there is, um, and I can't, I can't remember the name, I'm afraid, uh, but there is a, um, um, there is a, there is a Leonardo that was stolen from um, the um, a museum whose name I cannot pronounce, but it's in Krakow. Um, and I think that's generally held to be the most valuable uh, painting that was stolen. I'm sorry, I can't remember what it was called now. It's something, yeah, I, I, I just can't remember. Uh, but um, yes, that, that was stolen from, from a, a family collection in, in Krakow um, and, um, and has not been seen since and is, and is widely thought to, be, um, to have been destroyed. I mean, arguably the most valuable object lost in the Second World War was, was the Amber Room, um, which was stolen from uh, the Caterina Palace uh, in St. Petersburg. And that was, that was um, uh, dismantled and taken back to um, Germany by, by, the, uh, by the German army and stored in crates um, in a castle, uh, whose name I also can't remember, uh, but the castle was firebombed by the RAF and it's generally believed to have, um, have, have burnt up. There has been a, a a replica has been installed now in St. Petersburg. Um, so you can still get, and it's, I'm told, uh, unbelievable, but it's not, it's not the original Amber Rooms. Oh, thank you. Um, and the next question from Deepak Haria. Hi, Deepak. Uh, thanks, um, uh, thanks, James. Uh, very interesting. And uh, next time we meet, uh, we'll compare notes on something art, uh, which I was uh, part of back in the 90s, but I won't say it on live air. Um, question is, have you been offered uh, films and TV serial uh, projects on the back of your book? Or have you sort of um, thought about uh, taking it to a different stage? Uh, well, I mean, it's, um, yeah, I, I keep waiting for uh, Spielberg to call. Um, Hasn't quite happened yet. Um, I mean, the, the answer is that I have had various, uh, in fact, quite a few discussions over the years, uh, none of which have ultimately led uh, uh, anywhere. Um, and I've, I've sort, of sort of slightly jealously guarded the rights because I didn't want to sell the, I mean, I've had lots of people off me to buy the rights, but I only wanted to sell the rights if they were actually going to do something with it. Um, and I got closest with New Line uh, with a lady who was one of the producers on Lord of the Rings who was really interested um, and then something happened and she lost her job so that, that was that as it happens um, as it happens just before Christmas um, somebody's commissioned a script um, uh, sort of on a, on a sort of you know speculative basis um, uh, a production company in, in, in Los Angeles um, working with one of my best friends is a lawyer who's reinvented himself as a film producer. Um, and so he is handling that for me. So we'll see, we'll see. I mean, but I think with, with that type of stuff, you just, um, you know, if it happens, it happens, it'd be great. Uh, but um, I've, I've, I've had too many false, uh, false starts to get too excited about it. Thank you. I wonder who might play the main character in your sort of dream. <laughs> no, maybe Deepak. <laughs> Um, so then the next question, sorry, let me just check. I think we've got two more questions. Um, so I'll ask this, uh, we've got an anonymous one and then uh, we've got one more. And then, so if anybody has any further questions, do please pop them into the chat and we'll put them to James. Um, so this question is, it's no easy task to sit down and write a novel, especially if you've not thought of yourself as a writer. So what was it that compelled you to throw yourself into the task? Was there one moment? Yeah, um, well, it, it's sort of, I guess it's a mixture of um, circumstance and, um, yeah, the, <laughs> there probably was a moment, I was just thinking about it. Um, I, I, I'd sort of, the story of the double eagle had really, Captivate. I thought it was just an interesting story. And I remember I cut out 
I cut out an article from the paper, which I've still got somewhere, which was this story. And I just thought that's an interesting story because it's happening today, but it happened in the past. And it's a sort of way of linking history and the present day. And, and also it was just a fascinating insight into a period of history, which I knew nothing about. And um, as, uh, as, as Johnny Taylor will know, who's on the call, um, you know, that, that's always been a sort of passion of mine. And um, so that, I sort of had that. I then had set up a company um, which I had sold, um, not making a lot of money, but probably making enough money to take a year out and work out what I wanted to do next. Um, and the third thing that happened was that I'd got married and um, at the airport, I found a book by a friend of mine from university, um, a thriller, and it was absolutely shit. And I thought, my God, if he can write a book and get it published and whatever, so can I. And it, it, in a way, that was a sort of slightly pivotal movement because, um, as I was saying to Simon earlier, one of the reasons perhaps I'd never written before was because I sort of assumed that writing was a bit like being an astronaut or a Formula One driver. It was sort of something that other people did. I mean, it never occurred to me that I could be a writer in a way. And perhaps doing a literature degree, I sort of I put all these writers up on pedestals and I just didn't feel I could possibly write. But actually, when I realized that actually I don't have to write, you know, test the Durbils out, off, off, out of the box, I can just write, I can just write something and write something fun. And if if people buy it um, and, and like it and and, and um, uh, or even don't buy it, you know, it's still something I, I can do. And so it was it was actually <laughs> seeing seeing you know that someone else um could could do it and and that what they'd done was really not very good in my view just gave me the confidence that i could do that myself nothing like a bit of competition and <laughs> um so the last question so far unless anybody has any more to add um is a question that Mr. Everson has put and also Toby Sutherland. So I'm going to ask Toby to ask the question, please. Hi, James, lovely to see you. And I, I won't say what I was about to say about my own question now that I know that Simon posed the same question. Um, <laughs> if, if you could steal one well-known item, uh, what would it be and why? Um, okay, well, in the, in, the, in, the, in the best spirit of um, Blue Peter, here's one I, I, I made earlier, because um, I thought someone might ask that question. Um, if I can find the, the thing here. This is the Beatty Old Steel. Um, it's, um, it's by Jericho, it's in the Louvre. It's called, it's called the, um, the Raft of the Medusa. Um, it's, it's slightly tricky to steal because I think it's about four meters long by three meters high. Um, and when you go into the room it's in, it's almost at floor level. So when you stand there looking at it, the people are life size and it almost feels like you could sort of step into it. I remember, I remember seeing this thing and I was just, I don't know why, I was like totally, totally captivated with it. Um, uh, I, I probably have to buy a bigger house to fit it in. Um, and, and, and again, what interested me about it was I was like, well, what, what is it? Why would you paint this? It's like a weird thing to paint, right? A bunch of people on a raft. But of course, the story was that there was this terrible shipwreck uh, of this boat called the, the, the French naval frigate called the Meduse, ran aground off, off the coast of Mauritania. Um, 147 people set adrift on this sort of makeshift raft and all but 15 of them died um, over the next 13 days of sort of dehydration and hunger. Um, and there were rumors of cannibalism uh, as well in this sort of desperate fight to survive children and babies just being thrown off because they couldn't uh, so it's a sort of horrific uh sort of uh, moment of a massive scandal um uh, and this sort of sort of memorialized here and what you see it's sort of terrible scandal it's also sort of hope in it because you can see they're waving and i don't know whether you can see on the screen but just on the horizon sort of beneath the armpit of the sort of right hand figure there with the red red trousers there's a boat so the boat is appearing, and this, this is the moment of rescue. So I think, um, I think I, you know, that's if I could steal a painting, that 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 is one I would steal. I would also tell you that I have actually stolen a painting. Um, uh, and I've got a picture of it here. It's 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 um, it's in uh, Corpus Christi College, um, and I can't quite remember the events that led up to it. It's a bit of a haze, 
But what I can tell you is that I woke up the next day uh, with that painting on the top right there in my bedroom at the foot of my bed. Um, and I didn't realize that I had it. Um, I, I, I wasn't alone that night, let's put it that way. And when I, when I served, uh, there was a young lady with me who offered to make a cup of tea and she picked up what she thought was a tray um, and served me the cup of tea on the back of the painting. And I said, what the hell is that? And I sort of took it around, there's a big tea stain on the back of the painting, turned it around and it was this painting. So I went down to the college, the police were there, it was cordoned off. Luckily in those days, no CCTV. Um, and I managed to jump over a gate, um, put it back in the um, in one of the staircases. Um, and then I called the Porter's Lodge with a sort of very thick Welsh accent and uh, told them where the painting was. And it was recovered and now it's back in situ. So, you know, it's not quite the, uh, the, the raft of the Medusa, but it's, um, but I, I do have at least some small experience, but I did put it back. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't trade it for drugs. Brilliant. It, it I'm sounds glad, like I'm it's a lot easier. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, Toby. No, no, I'm just glad, glad I asked. And I'm, I'm sure Simon could find a space at Merchant Tailors for, for the, 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 the first picture you mentioned. <laughs> I'd happily take that. Thank you very much, Toby, for the suggestion. <laughs> um, so we've had one more question from Mark Medcalf, and then um, I think we'll make this the final one. So Mark, would you like to ask your question? Mark? Uh, Hello? Sorry. Hello. Go Hello? ahead, Mark. Right. Um, yes, hello. Um, I just wondered um, if you had any ideas of what happened to the um, dozen or so paintings that were stolen from the Isabella Gardner Museum on the west coast of America some 30 years ago. Have you heard any more about that? Well, um, I've got some pictures of that here, actually. Um, yeah, that's, that's the sort of... Um, I mean, by repute, the largest art theft um, ever done, certainly the, the sort of largest theft of private property in, in, in history. Um, I mean, $300 million worth of paintings. Um, and actually, interestingly, uh, the, 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 the Isabella Gardner Stewart Museum is a bit like the Wallace Collection in London. It's a, I don't know what, there's a, probably an official term for it, but it's a sort of fixed collection. When it was left to them, it was on the proviso that nothing was moved. So nothing could be sold, nothing could be bought everything should be left exactly as it was. And because of that, in the museum, the empty frames just still hang on the wall. They've not, uh, they've not replaced them with anything else or indeed taken the frames down. Um, uh, you know, the paintings will include a Rembrandt, there's a Vermeer, um, all sorts of different things. Um, and I think, I mean, what happened was people posed as police officers and that's this sort of e-fit sketch, broke in, tied up the people, were very targeted in what they stole. Um, um, so they you know, took some things and didn't take others, um, and they took they took weird things. I mean, they took they took a, a finial that was a Napoleonic finial from one of the sort of regimental flags, you know, sort of you know, and a Vermeer, it was sort of a bit weird, really. Um, so um, uh, yeah, the, the choice is slightly puzzling, um, and and the the, the theory mark, um, and I'm, you, you you may know more than me, in which case do chip in, but. But my, the, my understanding is the FBI, FBI thinks this was uh, a robbery planned by a criminal organization, you know, probably the sort of Boston Mafia. Mm -hmm. um, um, they've, uh, they've got no physical evidence at all. They had some suspects, but they couldn't make anything stick. Um, they've, they've mounted various sting operations. Nothing's really worked. Um, and um, the, the, I think the, the, the theory is that they're either been destroyed, which would be terrible, or they are sort of sitting somewhere um, awaiting what, who knows what, um, but certainly, I mean, it's very difficult to do anything. And potentially they've been, as I said earlier, potentially these things get traded. You know, I will take yeah. your shipment of cocaine for $10 million and a Vermeer, and maybe it's now sitting in some sort of Colombian uh, hacienda. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
Well, thank you very much, James. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and, yeah. and thank you for your generosity and sharing all your time and experience. It's been wonderful. Um, and there we have some applause <laughs> from Victor. It's, it's um, been fantastic. We will, obviously, we will um, put a recording up on the uh, website when, when we're able to. Um, and yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you to everybody for joining. And the next event will be on the 27th, uh, where we have a comedy evening from another OMT. Um, and fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, James. Thank you very much, James. Thank you, James, very much. <laughs>